Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's The Scientist webinar. I'm Betsy Young, the technical editor for The Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today, our panel of experts will be discussing remyelination, the restorative potential of an activated pool of endogenous oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, and new avenues of therapeutic intervention. We'd like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and the panelists will address these during the Q&A session at the end of each presentation. To ask a question, simply type your query into the question box located on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A sessions. The webinar platform is user-friendly. You can move or resize any of the windows by simply grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right-hand corner. You may need to move or minimize some of the windows to see the live view. The webinar will be archived on the Scientist website and we'll send you a link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsors, R&D Systems and BioLegend. R&D Systems was the first to commercially market the multifunctional cytokine TGF-beta-1. R&D Systems has since established itself as a developer and manufacturer of high-quality proteins and the world leader in immunoassays, as well as a producer of antibodies, arrays, cell selection and detection products, and other cell biology tools. We've been developing and manufacturing research reagents for cell biology for over 30 years. R&D Systems, Novus Biologicals, Tokris Bioscience, and Protein Simple are a part of Biotechni, where we provide researchers with high-quality reagents and instruments to optimize and standardize your workflow. BioLegend develops and manufactures world-class cutting-edge antibodies and reagents for biomedical research at an outstanding value to customers. Our broad product portfolio includes flow cytometry, cell biology, and functional reagents for research in immunology, cancer, and stem cells. With the acquisition of over 600 former Covance neuroscience antibody products in 2014 and the addition of a team of experienced R&D neuroscientists, BioLegend aims to advance and accelerate discovery in the areas of neurodegeneration, neuroinflammation, and synaptic biology. BioLegend is certified for ISO 9001-2008 and ISO 13485-2003. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Steve Goldman. A summa cum laude graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Goldman obtained his PhD at the Rockefeller University in 1983 and his PhD from Cornell in 1984. Dr. Goldman is presently professor of neuroscience at both the University of Copenhagen Faculty of Health in Denmark and the University of Rochester Medical Center in New York. At Copenhagen, he is the co-director of its Center for Basic and Translational Neuroscience, as well as a consultant neurologist at the Copenhagen University Hospital. At Rochester, he holds a concurrent appointment as a URMC Distinguished Professor of Neuroscience, where he co-directs its Center for Translational Neuromedicine and holds the Dean Zutz Chair of Biology of the Aging Brain. He is also a professor of neurology and neurosurgery at URMC, where he was the department chairman and neurologist-in-chief from 2008 to 2012. His research interests include cell genesis and regeneration of the adult brain, with a focus on the use of stem and progenitor cells in treating demyelinating and neurodegenerative diseases. As I mentioned, Dr. Goldman will answer your questions immediately following his presentation. Dr. Goldman? Hey, Betsy. Well, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, so I'll start right out um, with kind of a statement of, uh, of interest for today's purpose, which is looking at the glial progenitor population of the brain, of the human brain very specifically, and our, oh, our efforts over the years to use those cells as therapeutic reagents for the myelin diseases and at the same time as, as a means of modeling the glial contributions to, to brain disease. And so just um, we'll start off. looks like I'm running the, uh, the web session here. Okay, so 
this first slide that we're looking at, um, uh, it, you know, this is not to be memorized. This is a uh, schematic that basically maps out the different stages of human oligodendrocyte uh, uh, development and lists, uh, uh, this is essentially for the glial wonks amongst you, it lists the set of transcription factors that are involved at different stages during glial differentiation, but very specifically during oligodendrocyte differentiation, and then the variety of markers that we use to identify and select the cells. And so, of course, we're, we're interested in oligodendrocytes from the standpoint of their being the myelinogenic cell type of the nervous system and the cell type that uh, by virtue of making myelin um, in sheath axons and allow saltatory conduction within the nervous system. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of a neurologist who's interested in the disorders of myelin. And uh, of course, myelin comprises the white matter of the brain and the diseases of, involve white matter and involve myelin loss so really comprise a large, large swath of neurology, which, which we'll get to. But that, that's the source of my own interest in, in these cells. And so I, I show this, this slide basically just so that you have a, a sense of perspective. It's not anything to go into in detail for now, but, but of course it will be available uh, on the website afterwards for anyone who wants to take a look and, and go through these markers in, in greater detail. Uh, but they, uh, they do form essentially a common currency uh, for describing work like this. So some years back we isolated uh, human oligodendrocyte progenitor cells from initially adult human brain and found that those cells, if we transplanted them into areas of demyelination, were capable of remyelinating focally demyelinated lesions. And that's, that's what sparked our interest in using these cells potentially uh, clinically as therapeutic vectors. And then started look, we started looking at more and more, if you will, challenging models of demyelination and hypomyelination to get a sense of how far we could push this as a technique and as, as a technology. And so we found that, as I mentioned, adult cells, these are glial progenitor cells, and, and I should mention here that I'm using glial progenitor and oligodendrocyte progenitor interchangeably. In humans, glial progenitors are bipotential for astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, and they remain so up until their very last division. And so there's really no such thing in humans, as distinct from rodents, as a committed oligodendrocyte progenitor cell. These cells can always make astrocytes as well and vice versa. So I'll, I'll use those terms interchangeably. Uh, but the convention in the field is to say oligodendrocyte progenitor cells or OPCs, uh, but in fact these are glial progenitor cells. So we, we found, of course, that these adult-derived glial progenitor cells could remyelinate lesions, and then looking for a broader source of the cells, a more abundant source, went to fetal human brain tissue. And here we're looking at a slide that shows effectively a, a, a normal 20-week gestation age uh, human fetal brain. Th these are samples that we obtain in the setting of abortions done for uh, typically premature rupture of the membrane, sometimes sonographic failures not involving the CNS. And so they're, they're tragic cases, but, but nonetheless uh, provide very useful material for studying and, and potentially using these cells. So we developed the techniques for isolating the cells based on a couple of the markers that, that were in the previous slide. One's called A2B5, which is a, an antibody that recognizes a set of gangliosides that's expressed by progenitor cells, neural progenitor cells generally. And we deplete from that neural progenitor cell population cells that are neuronal or potentially neuronal. That involves depleting the population of cells expressing polycyalid and NCAM. And so you can see in this, uh, this slide that shows a two-color fluorescence-activated cell sort. The bottom graph here, uh, we can see that uh, the O4 uh, marker, which is a, an antibody that recognizes sulfatide, which is an oligodendrocyte antigen, that the vast majority of these A2B5 expressing cells from which the PSA NCAMP population has been depleted, the vast majority of these become oligodendrocytes within just a few days in vitro under conditions that push the cells towards oligodendrocyte as opposed to astrocyte differentiation. So this gave us a cell population that we could work with and it was quite abundant because th this, at this stage in human development, most of the cells being generated are glial progenitor cells. The period of neurogenesis is already complete. So then we went into a number of different models, and I'm only going to show you one here, which, which is called the shiver mouse, and it's, the, it's potentially the most uh, challenging of, of, of models in that th these animals, well, let's see, I don't seem to be getting the, the video to work. Well, 
These animals have a, uh, an early um, stop code on the first exon of the myelin basic protein gene. Oh, there they go. And now you can see why they're called uh, shiver. They don't so much as um, uh, shiver as shake. They're, they're extremely ataxic. Uh, they basically uh, never develop myelin appropriately. Myelin basic protein is required for myelinogenesis, for myelin compaction. So since they don't have myelin basic protein, myelin never develops. So what happens is they're born normally, but as they grow and as axons lengthen, those axons are not properly ensheathed, they're not properly insulated by myelin, and so saltatory conduction along those axons fails. And in that setting, as the animals get larger and get older, they get more and more symptomatic. So first they become weak in the hind limbs, then they become ataxic, as, as you see here. They become uh, weak ultimately in the forelimbs to the point where they really can't move around. They develop seizures, uh, status epilepticus is what usually kills them, typically like, really like clockwork at about 20 weeks of age. And so uh, shivers have been used for a long time as a model for looking at uh, the uh, at myelinogenesis and as the potential for cell populations to make myelin because if any myelin is made in these animals, you know that it has to be donor-derived. But nothing had ever been done that gave shivers an extra day of life. And so we, we were optimistic enough about the use of these cells and their ability to myelinate that we transplanted a number of animals and found that uh, we would see myelin produced, but in fact the animals would uh, would die really at the same time that they would have otherwise, around 20 weeks. And then when we analyzed the brains of those animals, we realized that the cells that were traversing uh, di different regions of brain, but specifically as they traversed gray matter to get to from one white matter tract to another, they were losing oligodendrocyte fake components. There's a lot of interesting subbiology behind that, but the bottom line is that we realized we needed to uh, use a multi-site injection protocol such that we were putting cells into the major white matter tracts up front. And so this is a protocol developed by Martha Windrum, a collaborator of, from, of mine for many years. And what Martha did was take uh, uh, essentially a 3D atlas of the of the mouse nervous system and, and identify uh, a mi the minimal number of points, turned out to be five points, at which cells uh, injected could uh, essentially migrate throughout all white matter tracts without having necessarily to traverse uh, gray matter tracts to get to the next white matter tract over. Of course, cells are migrating stochastically, but the point is that some cells are remaining within white matter tracts, and with five, five injections are enough to cover all the white matter tracts of the, of the central nervous system, spinal cord and brain, brain stem all. And so with using that protocol and then injecting the human glial progenitor cells, she found that, uh, and this is work that we published, oh, about, uh, oh, you know, it's, it's getting uh, old in the tooth now. It's about six years ago with the fetal tissue. We found that the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells would completely remyelinate the, the brains of these animals. And here we're looking at myelin basic protein in green. And this is essentially the uh, what the normal myelinated brain looks like in, in a mouse of, of this age. And, and this age here is 36 weeks, and that, that's remarkable because, uh, well, 35 weeks, because I mentioned before these animals die like clockwork at 20 weeks, and so this animal was actually rescued. And as it turned out, uh, we can reliably rescue most of these animals now, and th this gives you an idea of the density of the donor cells in these brains. There, there are a lot of donor cells here. Uh, this is a single 14 micrometer section. And it's been montaged in the XY plane, but it's, uh, you know, this is not a Z-stack, so there are an awful lot of human cells here. The red stain here is for a human nuclear antigen, which is a, a human-specific epitope on a histone. And so you have the feeling that, that there are an awful lot of human cells in these brains, and uh, they, at least many of them, become oligodendrocytes and go ahead and myelinate. And so this gives you an idea of just one what one of these brains looks like in toto, the, the myelination is complete, not only through the, through the brain, but as I mentioned, the, the spinal cord here, we're looking at one of these animals. This is just a transverse section of the spinal cord. The longitudinal tracts uh, uh, posteriorly are on the top, and the tra traversing tracts ventrally on the bottom. Uh, this is all basically a, a fully remyelinated spinal cord uh, down to the level of the cord equina, and basically, the cells stop at the CNS-PNS border. So here we're looking at the trigeminal ganglion with, um, if you look at uh, plate C, the human cells are in red, and they have migrated out to, but not into, the fifth nerve. And so they stop at the CNS-PNS border. They go ahead and myelinate, 
the central nervous tissue. They don't enter the peripheral nervous system and don't myelinate at all in the penis. So that, that's very neat subbiology there as well and, and some, something we've put some effort into sorting out. But, but in fact, the cells are migration limited from, in, from entering non-CNS tissue. Uh, that actually has significant implications in terms of some of the disease targets we're looking at, but that, that's for a, a later point. Now, one of the problems with this is that um, it's a slow process of remyelination. I present it as a problem up front. And, you know, on one hand, it's just the characterization of the system, but the fact of it is that the slow process of myelination is what delimits some of the potential utility of this uh, of this strategy. So here, meaning clinical utility. So here we're looking at 12 weeks, 20 weeks, 35 weeks. These are three different matched mice implanted at the same time with the same batch of cells and the same point in the midpoint of the corpus callosum is sampled. And it, it gives you a very good idea of what's happening. By, by 12 weeks after neonatal injections, and these injections, I should emphasize, are being done into immunodeficient shiver crosses on their first day of birth, right? So these are P0 injections, 12 weeks later, 12 weeks of age. You see that in green, uh, it turns out about 10%, we've quantified this in some detail, about 10% of the axons are ensheathed, but most of them are not. You get to a 50-50 by 20 weeks, five months, and then, and here to give you a better sense of it, the red fibers here are, are mouse axons. These are stained for nerve filament, and these are mouse axons that are ensheathed by the green human myelin basic protein. By the time you get out to 35 weeks, eight months plus, only at that point are all the axons myelinated in the corpus callosum. So you end up with animals where there's complete remyelination of the entire central nervous system but it takes nine months to get there in the brain. It actually takes about a year to get there totally as far as the spinal cord brain and, and all are concerned. And so there's essentially a race against time so that the animals that myelinate quickly enough survive and are rescued. Those that uh, do not, if the injections, you know, for example, are a lower dose or we don't achieve as widespread uh, initial dispersal, those animals don't make it. And so that has all sorts of implications clinically, which, which we'll get to. But at the end of the day, these animals uh, are not only rescued, but, but they're normal. So phenotypically, they're, uh, they are essentially improved back to almost baseline state. So here's one of these animals. Now, when this animal was uh, just a few months old, he looked as bad as the ones you saw on that first slide. To, to, in fact, uh, this one was one of those, those two animals uh, who was uh, ataxic and seizing. Uh, but here he is at 13 months, and uh, you know, he's, he's a little slow. Sometimes the, the hind limb strength uh, on some of these animals doesn't come back entirely, probably from some axonal loss that uh, in the setting of really long-term uh, hypomyelination. But otherwise, this animal is uh, completely recovered. Seizures have stopped. Uh, Four-limb and hind limb strength uh, largely come back. Uh, the the uh, ataxia has resolved. And so it's actually quite remarkable to see these animals slowly, month after month, get better as a result of the transplants and then be rescued. So we, st we became very optimistic about the potential use of this strategy in a broad variety of diseases. So here we're looking at a list, and in fact, uh, as we'll see later, this, this list has uh, become even more extensive, but these are essentially the prototypic white matter diseases of, of humans, and it includes both childhood uh, dis disorders of white matter and adult. And so, of course, we always think of adult white matter diseases from the standpoint of multiple sclerosis and, and the inflammatory demyelinations like transverse myelitis, but MS is certainly the most common adult inflammatory demyelination. But what's even more common are the vascular demyelinations that we in some way never really look at as white matter disease specifically, but that's what they are. And those, those include subcortical stroke. About a, um, you know, I'm a stroke neurologist personally, and about a third of uh, what we see in stroke are strokes of the white matter and they, that largely involve uh, oligodendrocyte loss. The diabetic uh, leukoencephalopathies, so this is the chronic white matter loss of diabetics with small vessel disease. Hypertensives get small vessel disease, very similar pathology, and they, they lose white matter. And that basically leads us into uh, the subcortical dementias that are associated with age-related white matter loss. And this is really a remarkable point because it used to be folks didn't live long enough to, to see uh, the, the, the high incidence of age-related white matter loss that we now see. But, but the fact of it is when most of us get into uh, our 70s, we've already lost significant white matter, and by the time we're in our 80s and 90s, much more so. And that's one of the major causes of, of dementia. Uh, and uh, there's an argument within neurology uh, how much late-onset dementia is really Alzheimer's versus the vascular subcortical dementia on a white matter basis. So it's an awfully important category of disease of an adult, but in some ways it's 
it's it's more clear cut, if you will, in childhood uh, cases. And so there are a variety of childhood disorders of white matter that involve either the storage diseases of the lysosomal storage diseases, things like t San Sandhoff's disease, Tay Sachs, Crabbe's. Uh, or the um, the straight hypomyelinations of the of the uh, congenital myelin um, loss or dysfunction, Pilsaeus Merzbacher disease, vanishing white matter disease, are in that category. And so the, these are rare diseases, but they are much more uh, clear cut, if you will, in terms of the disease environment. And so, from many standpoints, these are uh, in some ways more um, attractive targets for initial proofs of principle, uh, which we'll, we'll get to in terms of the use of these cells as clinical reagents. So we wanted to start developing this as a clinical strategy. And you know, one of the problems, as I just mentioned, is it takes so long for these cells to, uh, to, to differentiate as oligodendrocytes and then to get to where they need to be and to fully myelinate. And in fact, uh, you know, parenthetically, that shouldn't be surprising. A given human oligodendrocyte might uh, ensheath upwards of 100 axons. What we find is that they actually ensheath these axons effect effectively one axon at a time and a given axon might take a day or two for, to be ensheathed. Well, that oligodendrocyte might then have another 99 axons to ensheath, and so, you know, it adds up. And so by the time a given oligodendrocyte has really laid out all of its sheaths and, and ensheathed all of the axons in its vicinity, it's not surprising that you're looking at three, four months into a process after the cell has already become a mature oligodendrocyte, and that takes a few months in itself. So the question becomes how to speed that process up. And uh, you know, we and others have been looking at that from a variety of standpoints, but, but this in some ways is the most straightforward, and that's to select out cells that are the furthest along towards oligodendrocyte differentiation. And this was work of Fraser Sim, uh, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time a couple of years back and uh, has gone on to um, an independent uh, career at uh, SUNY Buffalo. And so what, what, uh, what Fraser did at, uh, in this work was to uh, as a genomics analysis, identify the PDGF alpha receptor as expressed by oligodendrocyte biased glial progenitor cells, and it has been known that the PDGF alpha receptor was uh, was expressed by these cells. But he then did a, a cluster analysis to, to identify a number of markers that uh, essentially defined the oligodendrocyte bias pool, and then uh, used the CD140 antibody, which is uh, basically it's an antibody against an epitope on PDGF alpha receptor, and sorted cells uh, from fetal tissue, and uh, was able to determine that the PDGF alpha receptor expressing pool comprised all of the cells in the human brain, that, at least from the fetal human brain, that had oligodendrocyte fate potential. So all the cells that could become oligodendrocytes or would become oligodendrocytes express the receptor. And all the cells that express the receptor, at least as derived from brain, were going to become oligodendrocytes. And so that was a very elegant demonstration that, that allowed him to uh, isolate these cells that were already strongly oligodendrocyte fate biased. And then when he transplanted those, if you look in plate E here, this is just at 12 weeks. And by this point, these CD140 isolates were able to myelinate over half of the axons in the corpus callosum at just three months. Uh, plate F here, we're looking at the A to B5 isolated pool, which is identical to what you'd seen before, where less than 10% of the axons have myelinated by that same time point. So just by, by choosing and isolating a pool that was more oligodendrocyte fate committed, Fraser was able to, to come up with a population that would myelinate several months more rapidly than, uh, than cells taken directly from tissue. Now, there have been other approaches uh, developed since then, uh, uh, actually several uh, by um, uh, Fossati and uh, Duvras and also um, by Vivian Tabar's group that, that have involved um, uh, speeding up essentially the time course to neural stem cell acquisition, and we're going to get to that from ES cells. But from tissue, this is about as, uh, as differentiated a phenotype as one can get. Uh, that is far enough along to become an oligodendrocyte and yet is still migratory and will still disperse throughout the nervous system. Now, uh, that, that slide I just showed you, by the way, I should say something about it. Uh, th this is the corpus callosum of a, of a shiver mouse that has been transplanted with the glial progenitor cells. And here we're looking at the donor cells, and they have become both the myelinated corpus callosum they become the oligodendrocytes that form the, this main white matter tract from one side of the brain to the other. Uh, but also, 
the green cells here are fibrous astrocytes that were also generated by the gliopogenitor cells. And so here the CD140 defined cells, even though they're oligodendrocyte biased and much further along towards oligodifferentiation, can still make fibrous astrocytes. Remember what I said before, up until the last division, they can make fibrous astrocytes as well. And so basically these cells are capable of reconstituting the entire white matter tract, in this case of the corpus callosum, both the glial infrastructure, if you will, the, the astrocytic infrastructure, and the oligodendrocytes that then line up along those fibrous astrocytes and, and lay down myelin sheaths. Now, if this is going to be useful clinically, then you know, we're not just going to neonatal newborn targets. These cells have to be able to migrate in, in postnatal and adult brain as well. The CD140 epitope recognizes, the again, the PDGF-alpha receptor-expressing cells. Well, that's the, uh, the stage of oligodendrocyte development where the cells are migratory in, in, in the developing brain. And so the question was, if we isolate this cell population that is migratory, normally, and we put it into an adult brain, where normally one does not see migration, are the cells migratory in a cell autonomous capacity? Are they going to be able to migrate throughout what would otherwise be considered a, a non-migratory environment? And so the only way to know is to do the experiment. So uh, Martha Windrum in the lab did this, which was to put the CD140 defined cells into adult shiver brains and found that the cells migrated every bit as uh, as robustly as in the early neonates. And here we're looking at a number of different sagittal sections. Uh, all the white cells are the human cells, and they're basically outlining the corpus callosum and the fimbria, the internal capsules of, of, uh, of the, these animals into which they've been transplanted in, in the adult shiver environment. Those cells will go ahead and myelinate. Here we're looking at one of these adult shivers, and we're looking at the corpus callosum and the fimbria, all the green is human myelin, and so this is all formed in a shiver that was transplanted uh, at six weeks of age. And then the animal was killed uh, between 19 and 20 weeks of age. But even transplanting this late is, su is sufficient to rescue uh, many of these animals. And it's very, very dense myelin. The animals that um, go ahead and, and are rescued to actually uh, completely remyelinate their corpus callosa, and that, and that again is in the adult uh, uh, shiver environment. So that tells us that the cells can migrate in the adult brain and can myelinate, uh, uh, hypomyelinated foci in, a, in adult brain. Well, so the next question becomes, if, if the cells are migratory in a cell autonomous fashion, uh, can they remyelinate tissue that has already been demyelinated? So the sh in the shiver environment, the, those, those axons never myelinated in the first place. And so the more challenging environment, which is the more akin to many human disease conditions, is to have axons that were normally myelinated then are demyelinated in the setting of pathology. Can they be remyelinated? That's the question. And so for, for this, uh, this is the work of uh, Steve Chances and uh, Lisa Zales in the lab. And what they did was use cuprazone as a, um, uh, as a toxin, basically. Cuprazone is an oligo, uh, oligodendrocyte toxin, and it uh, causes a chemical demyelination that's widespread. And they worked out a uh, procedure that involves long cuprazone exposure. It's a 20-week exposure, which is very long for, this, for the use of this toxin, which, is, which has been around for a long time, but, but this is one of the longest protocols that's ever been developed for it. And the reason that we devised this was specifically to uh, yield chronic demyelination with a pathology that then becomes similar to the chronic demyelinations of progressive multiple sclerosis and other conditions. And then we transplanted into these brains while they were uh, under cuprazone treatment. Now, it's important to note that cuprazone doesn't affect progenitors. It only kills mature myelin, mature oligodendrocytes. So the progenitors that are put in are not um, themselves damaged or, or, or uh, injured by, by the toxins, only the existing mature oligodendrocytes that are killed. And then we wait uh, some time after and then ultimately kill the animals either about 10 weeks after the cessation of cuprazone or, uh, or another uh, uh, three months after that. And so we're looking at relatively late time points after that, and what we see is the, for the cells that were transplanted during the phase of active demyelination, actually the human cells still migrate everywhere. And so every white dot in, the, in these coronal sections is a, is a human cell derived from the CD140 isolates that were transplanted into these cuprazone-treated brains during active demyelination. And you can see the cells, uh, despite the uh, active inflammatory and demyelinating nature of those brains, the cells get everywhere. 
and they go ahead and remyelinate the hypermyelinate or the demyelinated tracts in these brains. Here we're looking at the uh, red cells are human, and the green fibers, once again, this is the stain from myelin basic protein, and so these are oligodendrocytes that were produced from the human progenitors that were transplanted uh, into these adults that had already been cuprosome demyelinated. Here's another image, and you just get a sense of how, uh, after you wait long enough, just how abundant the, the myelination is and, and just, just how effective uh, the remyelination is by these cells. The cells, uh, you know, one wants to know whether they can be effective in animals larger than a mouse, and the answer is yes. Uh, here we're looking at adult rats, Joanna Osorio's work, and these are animals that were, where the cells were injected at a single site, and then all the yellow dots are human cells at um, 16 weeks thereafter. And then here we're out of 32 weeks after transplant, and you can see just how dense the, uh, the human engraftment is, uh, the human cell engraftment is of these rat brains. And so th this gave us all the information that we needed to, to, uh, to, to be able to start modeling this uh, realistically for human use. But if we're going to use this as, a, as an approach uh, in, uh, for human treatment, and then we need a more abundant, more predictable source than fetal tissue. And so we, I'm going to skip over a lot of detail here, but, uh, uh, but we developed a strategy for generating these cells from uh, embryonic stem cells and from induced pluripotential cells. And so this is a, this is a, a long differentiation strategy that was developed by uh, Sue Wang in the lab, published it uh, in 2013. Um, and it, uh, it essentially allows the high-yield production of human glial progenitor cells, oligodendrocyte or astrocyte biased as one wishes, or remaining bipotential from pluripotential cells. We initially published this in IPS, but it's equally effective in ES, as we'll see. Here we're looking at myelin basic protein. This is in a shiver, but as derived from the IPS cell-derived glial progenitor cells. And here in an adjacent section, as cells stained for gliofibrillaricidic protein. So this is the fibrous astrocytic architecture that is providing the infrastructure for these uh, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells to become oligodendrocytes and myelinate. So both cell types are being made by, by these glial progenitor cells that are pluripotential cell derived. And here we're looking at uh, the, the green cells are uh, expressing myelin basic protein. These are oligodendrocytes that are ensheathing the, the rat, uh, or in this case mouse, I'm sorry, axons in red. Same kind of image we saw before, but in fact this is all from pluripotential cells. And so this told us that uh, we now had a more abundant source of cells for, for this purpose. Uh, here we're looking at normal myelin being made by, by these iPS cells. Uh, here we're looking in H at uh, no, normal uh, nodes of Ranvier with, with essentially the reconstitution of nodes of Ranvier with uh, the um, sequestration of uh, fast sodium channels as indicated here by, by spectrum staining, flanked by, by uh, uh, Casper protein that defines the, the nodal structure. And so all of that predicted that, that, that all this myelin, this uh, ES and IPS derived uh, oligodendrocyte derived myelin would be functional. In fact, it was. We see really complete uh, remyelination of the nervous system of these animals. And here's the difference in survival. The, the IPS derived oligodendrocyte progenitor cell and grafted animals have uh, lifespans that are no different than the background strain here. These are RAG2 immunodeficients. And to take this essentially to a, 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 a more clinically um, focused endpoint, uh, we, we then developed uh, strategies, which I can go into afterwards for anybody interested, for making these cells under what are called GMP-compliant conditions, uh, good manufacturing practice. These are a set of conditions that are mandated by the regulatory authorities, by the FDA uh, in the U.S., by the EMA in Europe, for uh, for preparation of cells that might be delivered to, to, to patients. And this is simply showing that we can reconstitute the corpus callosum, in this case of a shiver, but using oligodendrocyte progenitors that are derived under GMP conditions. This is with the H9 human ES line. Simply a higher power of the same, showing just, just how dense the, the remyelination is. And that basically tells us that this should be a, a feasible strategy for going clinical. And uh, this is the first clinical trial of these cells. So the trial has not begun yet, but we have gotten it funded. It's before the FDA now. And it's basically uh, using human embryonic stem cell-derived glial progenitor cells for secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. In secondary progressive MS, basically the period of active 
inflammatory disease is uh, largely over. There's some uh, some mild ongoing inflammation. The patients will be immunosuppressed, but but the real pathology here is chronic axonal uh, demyelination. And so basically, axons are still there, uh, but they have been uh, essentially denuded of myelin. So the question is how how to replace that myelin, and this is our proposal for doing that. And this will be in, in fact a, a clinical trial by by way of an experiment, if you will, to see whether or not um, uh, this will be an effective strategy for not only remyelinating the MS nervous system, but, but for allowing functional recovery. Now, I'm going to close with uh, just uh, a, a different take on this. Uh, it will be interesting for the, uh, for the uh, basic scientists amongst you who are involved in modeling. So I showed this picture before, just how dense the human cells are in these brains, and that raises the possibility, well, if there's so many human cells, where are the mouse cells? And the answer is the mouse cells are gone. So the the human glial progenitor cells outcompete the mouse cells, and there's a period of active competition between the resident host mouse glial progenitors and the human cells. And here we're looking at one snapshot at uh, about seven months after neonatal transplant. The human cells in green, the mouse cells in red, these are all glial progenitor cells staying for the same marker. It's called NG2, which stains a chondroitin sulfate uh, proteoglycan. It's made by glial progenitor cells, but there are human versus mouse-specific epitopes. And so we can define the two species contributions. And we see the human cells have largely taken over. This is what this looks like in real time. At four months, eight months, 12 months, you see the mouse cells in red slowly getting pushed out to the cortical rim until finally by 12 months there are no mouse glial progenitor cells left in these brains. And that has real implications. Uh, first, to get a quick look at these cells, Th these are not simple bipolar cells as they are in culture. Here we're looking at the human glial progenitor cells. These are individually mapped by Joanna Osorio, and you can see just how complex these cells are. They have their own fiber domains and their own architecture that in some ways uh, is, is, is similar to that of, of astrocytes. And what happens is that over time, uh, many of these cells become astrocytes. And so, of course, in the hypomyelinated environment, they are becoming oligodendrocytes. In a normal myelin wild type environment, uh, they stay as progenitors once they've taken over these brains. But in the course of normal astrocytic turnover, astrocytes are over, usually or always turning over. And normally, astrocytes are replaced by new astrocytes from parenchymal progenitor cells, but now the progenitor cells are human, so the, as astrocytes are replaced, they're replaced with human astrocytes. And so here we're looking at three months after neonatal chimerization, and we see all the green cells here. These are human astrocytes. By the time we get out to seven months, most of the astrocytes in these brains, all the fibrous astrocytes of the white matter tracts, and many of the protoplasmic astrocytes by this point uh, are human. And so slowly but surely, there's the humanization of these brains uh, in regards to their astrocytic complement as well as their oligodendrocytic. And so uh, Betsy tells me I have four minutes left, and so that, that's going to be uh, just enough to, to close with uh, one example that I'll show you of what we've done with this uh, technique. And so here, here we have an approach now for replacing the glial progenitor populations of brains, of mouse brains, with human glial progenitor cells, but we can also make those human glial progenitor cells from pluripotential cells, not just from embryonic stem cells, but also from induced pluripotential cells, which means we can make them on a patient-specific and disease-specific basis. So, you know, you folks out there in the web audience, I could take any one of you, take a skin biopsy from you, and a year from now, give you back a mouse where all the glial cells in that mouse's brain are yours. And so that, that actually... It gives us a tremendous uh, opportunity in terms of asking what the role of glia are in disease processes and specifically what the role of human glia are in human diseases. There is a large host of neuropsychiatric and uh, neurodegenerative diseases that humans get and animals don't. And uh, the, the suspicion has been that uh, these have significant glial contributions uh, because there has been a significant evolution of glia during phylogeny. And so one, one example I'll show you here, the only example I'll show you here, but we have a number now, uh, of where we've modeled the, uh, the role of glia in the disease process is that of Huntington's disease. And we've taken, in this case, embryonic stem cells. We didn't have to use IPS here, but embryonic stem cells from sibling pairs where one stem cell has, is normal and the other has the Huntington uh, mutation, the polyglutamine expansion of the uh, mutant Huntington gene. 
And Huntington's disease, for those of you not familiar with it, is a genetic disease, it's autosomal dominant, it's f from a, a CAG repeat expansion that's mutant in the uh, first exon of the Huntington gene. And uh, the longer the, the expansion, the earlier the uh, development of disease phenotype, and, and, uh, and of course these patients typically uh, die in their, in their 40s, early 50s. Uh, from this uh, uh, otherwise completely untreatable disease, which has always been assumed for no particularly uh, um, definite reason to be neuronal. Uh, and, of course, there's significant neuronal pathology in the disease, but as it turns out, there's significant gliopathology as well. So here we've made a, a chimeric striatum. All the pink cells are human. All of the green cells are human astrocytes, but this is a Huntington's. Uh, th these cells are derived from a Huntington's um, embryo, and so these are all... Uh, Huntington's mutant human glia in the mouse environment. And this is simply a higher power to give you an idea of what the admixture looks like of the human Huntington mute, mutant expressing astrocytes in this otherwise uh, um, mouse green glial environment. And so this, these strata are really admixtures of, of human and mouse astrocytes. And this is the result. Uh, this is the only slide I'll show you in terms of functional data. Uh, this was published in uh, Nature Communications uh, maybe two months back that, uh, for any, anybody interested in the details and as far as the Huntington's model is concerned. But the bottom line is that the mice, and these are normal mice, uh, who were transplanted with the human Huntington glia developed a significant uh, phenotype so that uh, they showed much worse motor performance as they aged than a variety of controls. Animals who were transplanted with normal, actually sibling-derived uh, uh, control glia or, or just saline controls. Uh, so here the uh, rotor rod performance basically is significantly worse, and these animals were transplanted into their striata. And so here is a, a behavioral phenotype that is associated with glial chimerization, and it's only of the glia, in an otherwise normal mouse. And so this is telling us that glia have a really significant role to play in the development of, in this case, Huntington's disease. And uh, this is how it plays out uh, a little more broadly. Uh, the, the Huntington's um, uh, uh, mutation, if, if you look at it from that standpoint, if the mutant cells can give it a disease phenotype, then the flip side is that normal cells put into, the, into a Huntington's environment should have a rescue effect, or at least an ameliorating effect. And that turned out to be the case. And so I'll close with this. We took normal gliopogenitor cells and put them into a mouse model of Huntington's disease. This is the R62 transgenic, which typically dies, dies young of a severe form of Huntington's disease. It has a long CAG repeat expansion that's been engineered in, into its Huntington gene. And so we find that the animals where we've injected normal gliopogenitors just into the striatum, not otherwise, um, have improved motor function, they live longer, and the striatum itself has a lesser degree of involution, me meaning that it maintains its architecture for, for much longer. And so that, that actually uh, made us very um, optimistic in terms of the potential use of these cells as cell therapeutics, not just in the myelin diseases, but in other diseases of glia or, or degenerative and psychiatric disorders in which glia have significant roles to play. And that, that includes uh, um, everything from uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. There's uh, an evolving literature there, frontotemporal dementia, schizophrenia. And they, these are a variety of disorders where the, the glia glial pathology have been invoked, and now we can think in terms of modeling these disorders using these types of uh, human chimeric mice. And at the same time, it, it opens up a, a broad variety of other potential disease targets for using these cells as therapeutic reagents. And so this is just, uh, this, this summary slide just goes through the, the different uh, uh, sources potentially of these cells, whether from fetal tissue or embryonic stem cells or from induced pluripotential cells, the ways we have of sorting the different phenotypes, and then, of course, the uh, different disease targets that accrue to either adult or, uh, or pediatric pathology. And then, you know, every couple of years I seem to have to review this field, and there's always more disease targets being added as we learn more and more about the role of glia in these diseases and as the technology improves in terms of their potential therapeutic use. So I'll close with that, and uh, th these are just the, the oh, gee whiz, this, this is the one slide that didn't, didn't come out well here. Well, in any event, uh, these are the folks, uh, most of whom 
whose names remain on the slide, uh, who were involved in the work. Uh, Martha Windrum developed many of the uh, transplant strategies over the years. Sue Wang developed the, the techniques for generating these cells from pluripotential cells. Mike and Niedergaard is my long-term collaborator in looking at the behavioral and functional effects of, of this uh, chimerization approach. And Fraser Sim, I mentioned before, is having developed the CD140 technology. And I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. I know you have to run, but let's take a couple of quick questions from the audience. Um, we have one here for you. Is the MS clinical trial that you mentioned based on autologous or allogenic cells? And if they're allogenic cells, will they be rejected by the patient's immune system? Yes, yeah, good question. So these are allogeneic cells, uh, and uh, MS patients are typically immunosuppressed. Uh, so we, we are going to change the immunosuppression regimen for these patients, but they will be on active immunosuppression. The immunosuppressants that we use in MS um, are, tend to be well tolerated over long periods of time. You know, that's a field of, of its own in terms of uh, the care for MS patients vis-a-vis -vis their immunosuppressants. But patients who have evolved towards secondary progressive MS typically uh, have a lesser um, degree of inflammation, many, many fewer inflammatory relapses. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, precisely because these are allogeneic cells and could present an antigenic stimulus, these patients are going to be maintained uh, as per current protocol on tacrolimus and uh, mycophenolate uh, for half a year after transplant and then being then will be switched over to mycophenolate alone. That, that at least is our current protocol. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. And one last question. Could this study be applied to those with schizophrenia? Could schizophrenia um, caused by a lack of myelination uh, be remedied? Yeah, very, very interesting question. So uh, uh, juvenile onset schizophrenics, there is actually already a significant literature, uh, are in fact uh, congenitally uh, or at least developmentally hypomyelinated. And so there are significant myelin defects in schizophrenia. And the GWAS studies for a number of years have, have implicated um, oligodendrocyte um, genes in the genesis of schizophrenia. We have already started to model schizophrenia using these uh, human gliochimeras with cells taken from schizophrenic patients. And we do, in fact, see a behavioral phenotype as well as a hypomyelination phenotype. And so it's, it's a very real question, if you will, in terms of what the degree of involvement is of glial pathology in schizophrenia. So we're modeling that now, whether or not uh, cell therapeutics could potentially be used in support or of, of or in treatment of schizophrenia, that's another story. And I think at, at this point in the game, that would be a stretch, but these will certainly be interesting models for testing other, other therapeutics for schizophrenia. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Goldman. Yeah, well, thank you. As a reminder, if you had a question for Dr. Goldman and he didn't have time to answer it today, we will be sharing with you his email address so you can reach out to him after the webinar. Our next speaker is Dr. Yasir Ahmed Syed. Dr. Syed is a senior postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Mark Cotter at the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute, University of Cambridge, and also a senior member of Robeson College, Cambridge University. He received his master's degree in biotechnology from the University of Mysore in India and his PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Experimental Medicine in Germany. Recently, Dr. Syed was awarded a fellowship to start his own group at the Neuroscience and Mental Health Institute at Cardiff University. His research focuses on mechanisms underlying oligodendroglial differentiation, as well as the functional role of selected signaling cascades on oligodendroglial differentiation and remyelination, which can be stimulated to overcome the limitations of myelin repair that lead to symptom progression in multiple sclerosis patients. Dr. Syed? Hi, thanks for the introduction and welcome to all those people who are joining today for today's webinar. Um, in, in, in the next uh, couple of minutes, I would like to give you uh, the general introduction uh, 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 of the disease pathology, then give you two examples of my work which has been directed towards enhancing and promoting the remyelination, and briefly discuss the challenges in identifying the drugs in order to promote the myelin repair. As you as well, as many of you know that the multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder of central nervous system that results in damage to myelin and nerve fibers. One of the oldest known description 
of the case of the MS is referred to the woman deposited in this biography, which is that of the Saint Litvina. The Litvina lived in Holland around 14th century, and the text reveals that the she was afflicted with the disease, which has many characteristics that we can associate today of the MS. And later on in the 19th century, Robert Craswell made the first description of this pathology by making the hand-painted illustration of these, uh, le of these lesions. Few would disagree that the serious study of the human demyelinating diseases began by that of the charcoal in the last three decades of the 19th century. From that point till now, I believe that we have made a significant progress in understanding the pathology and mechanism of the disease, which has now set a platform for developing the therapeutics for this disorder. The myelin sheath are the complex membrane structure and they are formed around the axons and is the principal target in the demyelinating diseases like MS. In the central nervous system, the myelin sheaths are formed by the oligodendrocytes. Apart from providing the salutary signal conduction, the myelin sheaths provide the tropic support or the metabolic support and protect the axons. And most of the nerve fibers, as most of the, as most of the nerve fibers that are surrounded by the myelin membrane, act to speed up the nerve impulses. The myelin sheath contains the periodic breaks, which is often referred as the nodes of brain via. And when the, myelinate, when the myelinated nerve, nerves can transmit a signal by jumping from node to node at, at high speed as much as the 100 meters per second. And we know that the number of the disease leads to the destruction of these myelin sheath, otherwise what is called as the demyelination, which results in the slowing down or blocking of the nerve impulses. An area where the myelin has been destroyed is called as the plaques or as the lesion. So following the demyelination, uh, the new myelin sheaths can be restored to the denuded axons with the help of the resident stem cells. This rege regenerative response is often referred as the myelin repair or the remyelination. Re if the remyelination is successful, this results in the functional recovery, and if it fails, it ultimately leads to the degeneration of axons. And what you, you see is the forebrain section of a patient who was diagnosed with an MS. The section is stained with the luxal fast blue to reveal the area of the cortical myelination in the subcortical white matter. The green arrow here represents the areas of the chronic demyelination, and the red arrow indicates the shadow plaques in which the demyelinated axon have undergone the remyelination. And typically in any MS uh, specimen, we can see a varial degree of the remyelination happening. So data from the Robin Franklin lab has demonstrated that the using the Crelax fate mapping experiment, that the following the demyelination in the ventral spinal cord, the NG2 expressing OPCs that are in the green are abundant in the lesion following five days of the post, uh, following five days of the lesion induction. However, at the 10th day when the lesions were analyzed, they could see that the lesion has undergone the complete remyelination. And these green OPCs that can they can now seen to producing the new myelin sheets around the demyelinated axons detected by the expression of the PLP, which is the marker of the uh, of the myelinating uh, cells, and suggesting that the OPCs are the principal source of the remyelinating oligodendrocytes. Few other studies have also demonstrated that the remyelinating oligodendrocytes may also come from stem and progenitor cells from adult subventricular zone. OPCs constitute about 5% of the total brain cells and are present both in gray and white matter. The OPCs can potentially adopt an alternative cell fates under different physiological and pathological condition or upon an injury. Hence, they can sometimes refer to as adult stem cells of the central nervous system. However, the question, however, their potential to proliferate is rather limited to be truly called as an adult stem cells. The, the remyelination proceeds in the two main steps. The first involves the migrate, the recruitment of OPCs, 
by proliferation and possibly migration. And this leads to the second stage where the OPCs engage the demyelinated axons and differentiate into myelin forming oligodendrocytes. In MS, the remyelination is often incomplete and fails. In addition to the generic factors like sex and age, theoretically, the remyelination can fail because of the three possibility. The first possibility could be that there is lack of the lack or de deficiency in number of progenitor cells, and the second possibility is the lack of the recruitment of this progenitor, and finally, the failure of these recruited cells to differentiate. In the field so far, at least two main approaches have been proposed to enhance the production of the mature oligodendrocyte and for the myelin repair. The first involves the transplantation of the OPCs where the lesion, uh, where there is a lack of the deficiency of progenitor cells. This could be achieved by cellular transplantation and is often referred as exogenous way. This has been well discussed in our previous talk and discussed the pros and cons by the Steve. In the second method, which involves the mobilization of the endogenous cells to form the, to, to the area of demyelination by recruitment and pushing these cells towards differentiation, what is classically referred as endogenous way of remyelination to form the new myelin forming oligodendrocytes and functional repair. A number of the clinical studies have demonstrated that the, that the chronic demyelinating lesion often contain OPCs or premyelinating oligodendrocytes. The presence of these immature OPCs or the or immature oligodendrocytes in demyelinating lesions suggests that the remyelination fails because the OPCs fails to differentiate. So the question that I've been working so far is how can we turn on these non-remyelinating OPCs that are present in the chronic active lesion into remyelinating oligodendrocytes? The presence of the inhibitory extracellular factors and also the intracellular factors could be um, blocking this uh, differentiation. I will give you one of these examples in my talk as how this can be approached. So far, we, our lab and the lab around the world has been working on to identify these lesion-associated inhibitors. And this includes a long range starting from PSA NCAM to uh, Notch 1 hyaluron lingo myelin proteins, TIP30, VIN3A, CXCR2, and CMA3A. And the leads continues to grow on. In our lab, we have identified that the presence of the myelin inhibits the CNS remyelination. So following the focal demyelination in the brain stem and later augmenting it with the purified myelin membrane, what was absorbed at the proliferation and the migration of the OPCs were unaffected. However, the presence of the myelin debris was able to block the differentiation of the OPCs into mature oligodendrocyte. On the right-hand side, you can see an electron micrograph of the myelin-treated lesion, where the axons are abundant and separated by one another by the presence of the uncleared myelin debris, whereas most of the axon in the control lesions that got the PBS injection, they were reinvested with the myelin sheets, suggesting that the presence of the myelin inhibits the CNS remyelination by inhibiting the OPC differentiation. When we had a look at the electron micrograph of the biopsies of acute MS lesion and the proteomic analysis of this lesion, what was clear is that there was the presence of the myelin debris. So I was more interested to identify what is that molecular substrate in the myelin that is responsible for this OPC differentiation block and to determine whether the neutralization of this myelin inhibitor may constitute a novel target for remyelination therapy. In order to do this, I set up an in vitro assay where the OPCs were cultured for two days on polylysine as a control and on rat and human myelin substrate, after which the cells were analyzed for the expression of O4 and myelin basic protein which are the mature and by which are the mature a marker of oligodendrocyte differentiation. The graph here are the, are the representation of the result, which confirms that in the presence of the both 
rat and the human myelin, the OPCs fails to differentiate to form the myelinating oligodendrocytes. And these are the micrographs from the control and that of the rat uh, myelin substrates, which showing that the, it's impaired the OPC differentiation. When the, when the myelin were treated with the protease or that of the lipases, what we can see is the, the loss of the protein results in the loss of the inhibitory activity of the myelin. However, when the lipase, when the myelin was treated with the lipase, the inhibitory activity was retained, suggesting that the inhibitory activity, effect, inhibitory effects are associated with the protein component of the myelin. In order to identify the protein that is responsible for this inhibition, I developed a three-step chromatographic protocol where the myelin was uh, where where the myelin protein was subjected to the biochemical fractionation. The process included that the myelin from the uh, from the rat was enriched for the myelin protein. Later on, it was subjected to the carboxymethyl column and. The, and the inhibitory activity was localized to that of the non-binding fraction. This fraction was then subjected to a high-Q on an exchange column where the inhibitory activity was uh, localized to that of the binding fraction. This was then subjected to the Cephalix X100 cell ex uh, size exclusion chromatographic clump, which where uh, the inhibitory activity was localized to a particular fraction, which is represented on a chromatogram by the, by the green color. Following some bioinformatic analysis, we were able to isolate efrin B3 as a, a molecular substrate of the myelin that's mediating the efrin block. Just to remind that the efferin proteins fall into two classes on the basis of their mode of attachment to the membrane, either through the glycosyl phosphatyl inositol linkage, which are called as efferin A class, or through the transmembrane domain, and which is having a short cytoplasmic region, which are referred to as efferin B class. The vertebrate genome encodes at least 14 different F receptors and five efferin A ligands and three efferin B ligands. The efferins have been well characterized for their role in neural development, angiogenesis, cell migration, and that of the cancer. To further specify the location of efferin B3 in myelin, a immunogold electron microscopy was conducted on the murine corpus callosum white matter at one month of the age. The pattern detected indicates that the efferin B3 is present in the inner sheet of the membrane and forms an integral component of the myelin membrane. In the adult CNS, the efferin B3 is predominantly expressed by oligodendrocyte and form the main sources of the inhibitory block, which we observe, which we see in MS white matter lesion, and probably this accumulates as a consequence of the demyelination. In order to validate it, in order to validate that the efferin B3 is present in the MS lesion, I performed the immunoprecipitation for efferin B3 and two chronic active MS lesion extract and the true control white matter, which confirmed the presence of the efferin B3 in MS lesion. When the, F, when the OPCs were exposed to the substrate containing the recombinant efferin B3, in which the transmembrane segment was replaced with an FC tag to make it soluble, I could observe a concentration-dependent impairment of the O4 and MBP, as reflected in these uh, pictures. The, in, the presence, in, the, in, the, in the presence of efferin B3, the cells fails to, uh, fails to uh, differentiate by impairment of O4 MBP uh, uh, expression, whereas in the, pig, in the control, the cells go on to beautifully form the process and express O4 and MBP3, suggesting that the efferin B3 inhibit the oligodendrocyte differentiation. The effect of this efferin B3 was specific as tunnel assay and the, and the cell counts did not reveal any difference when cultured in the control and the treated substrate. 
Not only did the presence of Fn B3 impairs the differentiation, but also has negatively affected the process formation, which resulted in majority of OPCs being arrested at an immature monopolar or bipolar state. The next question was which of these F receptor mediate the if inhibitory effect of Fn B3? To address this, I conducted the immunoprecipitation of OPC's protein extract with antibodies against individual F receptor followed by Western blotting with anti-phosphotyrosine antibody. The results reveals that a strong activation of FA4 and FB2 receptor in the presence in, in, in response to the Frin B3, suggesting that, uh, suggesting that these two receptors could be activated. However, the Fn B2, uh, the FB2 expression seems to be relatively low in comparison to the FA4, which basically can kind of lead to the conclusion that the the effect of the Fn B3 is predominantly carried with that uh, through the FA receptor. I then next assess the effect of the Fn B3 on the myelin regeneration in vivo. For this purpose, I used the focal demyelination model where the stereotactic injection of the ethylene bromide, ethylene bromide in the right caudal cerebellum plancal led to the demyelination, after which they were, uh, the, the, the control animals got the infusion of FC fragment through the asthmatic pump and, uh, and, the, and the another set of uh, uh, lesions got the infusion of recombinant Fn B3. As you can appreciate from these pictures, that the control animal following the 28 days, there were the complete uh, reinvestment of the myelin sheet, whereas the lesion that got the infusion of Fn B3, most of the axons were denuded, suggesting that the, uh, the, the uh, Fn B3 blocks the remyelination process. And this was quantified by the rank analysis, which showed the significant impediment between the two groups. And, and you can see here the electron micrograph of the Fn B3 infused lesion showing the denuded axons without the presence of the myelin. I next went on to analyze the effect of the developmental effect of following the loss of Fn B3 and found that the more myelinated axon in carpus callosum at one month of the age in the Fn B3 deficient mice in comparison to the wild type mice. The relative thickness of the myelin sheath as measured by G ratio were comparable between the wild type and knockout, suggesting that the loss of Fn B3 results in accelerated myelination without affecting the myelin thickness. The next and important question was, can we neutralize the effect of this inhibitory molecule? In order to do this, uh, I took the antibody uh, neutralization approach where I took two uh, Fn B3 antibodies that were raised against the extracellular and intracellular domain. Following the experimental demyelination and giving the Fn B3 antibodies for two weeks, the lesions were scored on the basis of the rank value. The results suggest that the lesion from the animals got Fn B3 antibody were significantly better remyelinated, suggesting that the antibody mediated neutralization promotes CNS remyelination. The two pictures here on the, left, uh, on, the, uh, on the right is one from the control lesion that got the IgG, whereas that on the extreme right is the lesion that got the Fn B3 antibody. And you can appreciate that the lesion that got the Fn, uh, Fn B3, there were considerable higher number of remyelinated axons as evidenced by the thin myelin sheets. Just to conclude this part, what I had said so far is that the Fn B3 is a myelin-associated inhibitor of oligodendrocyte differentiation, and the inhibitory effect of the myelin on the CNS remyelination can be reversed by masking it with the Fn B3 antibody. So another conceptually attractive approach as to enhance CNS remyelination is to target the mechanisms that are activated and that could be therapeutically amenable to enhance OPC differentiation and CNS remyelination in presence of extracellular inhibitors. 
So in past, I have worked to identify the, the key pathways that could be pharmacologically targeted to enhance the OPC differentiation in the presence of extracellular inhibitors. These are FinRoA cascade, PKC marks, uh, cascade, and today I'm going to take you through a little bit about MAP kinase signaling in the myelin regeneration. To identify the early transcriptional events that initiate OPC differentiation into oligodendrocytes, uh, a transcriptional profiling experiment was performed on the primary rat OPC's monocultures directly after purification following differentiation after 4 and 12 hours. What we saw was that the several members of the mitogen activated protein kinase or the MAP kinase pathway were differentially regulated during the early stage of this OPC differentiation. We also saw an enrichment of these signaling, MAP signaling molecules during the early process of the myelin regeneration in, in vivo, suggesting that the MAP kinase signaling is activated during the early stages of the OPC differentiation. And, clear, and if so, can we basically you manipulate this? So as some of you are aware that the MAP kinase signaling involves both classical ERK-mediated and P38-mediated signaling cascades. In order to test whether these molecules are activated, the OPCs were cultured for one day in differentiation medium in the presence and absence of myelin-associated inhibitor. And the assessment of the phosphorylation for the ERK and P38 MAP kinase demonstrated a significant reduction of the MAC of ERK and P38 MAP kinase activity, suggesting that, that these uh, factors are, uh, are activated. What we know from the literature is the downstream of these two important uh, factors is the presence, uh, e, e, they do terminate at the CREB1 as a downstream effector of, uh, of P38 and ERK1. The OPC difference is uh, in order to activate CREB1, these two pathway, uh, these two molecules has to be phosphorylated. In the presence of the myelin-associated inhibitors, not only it impaired ERK1-2 and P38 MAP kinase, but also resulted in the impairment of the CREB1 phosphorylation. So based on this result, we can propose a model that the ERK that, the, 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 the and P38 can do a, a, a merge at the CREB1, and we can, uh, and, and we can increase the activity, uh, and we can increase the activity of, the, of these two molecules by elevating the level of cyclic AMP. Or otherwise, we can inhibit the uh, activity of the cyclic AMP hydrolyzing enzyme by the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, uh, that of the Roli prime. In order to test this hypothesis, uh, I exposed the cells back up to the uh, to the uh, in the culture of the cells in the presence and, and absence of the myelin associated inhibitor. And in those cells that were cultured in the presence of the myelin associated inhibitor, were given uh, cyclic AMP and the cyclic AMP hydrolyzing uh, enzyme PDE4 inhibitor Roli prime. What we saw following 48 hours of the culture is that in the presence of the cyclic AMP and, and those that were exposed to the PDE4 inhibitor Roli prime, we saw that the cells were rescued and they could go on to different shades. Having this result in vitro, we went on to validate its effect in vivo and its effect on myelin regeneration. So aged animals were given the Roli prime for 14 days by subcutaneous osmotic mini pump and the control animals got the PBS. The investigators that were blinded for the rank analysis, the, the, the analysis showed that the extent of the remyelination was significantly enhanced for those uh, animals that got the Roli prime uh, dosage, suggesting that the, the inhibition of the PDE4 inhibitor promotes remyelination. So what I had said so far is that the cyclic AMP ERK uh, and P38 MAP kinase is functionally important intracellular signaling cascade to promote CNS remyelination, and PD4 inhibition could pay a way to enhance remyelination in chronic demyelinating diseases such as the multiple sclerosis. In a very uh, recent review uh, published by Sherrell, summarizes 
three major pathways that could be critical for myelin, uh, myelin regeneration and which could have some crosstalk between uh, each other. The first of it is the wind signaling, uh, wind signaling pathways, where, the, where a number of the studies have shown that the wind signaling during remyelination in adult CNS and support the importance of wind signaling in inhibition during remyelination as to ensure the adequate OPC differentiation. And the, and the second one is the mTOR pathway where the overall data from the recent studies support that the mTOR is a key regulator of OPC differentiation and remyelination throughout the CNS, and, the, and this pathway could be regulated not only for the differentiation and the myelin protein transcription, but also translation and initiation and, and in regulation of the myelin thickness and biogenesis. The third pathway is the MAP kinase pathway, which I have touched upon um, uh, in, in, my, in, in my previous slide. I just want to point out some of the drugs that are currently being developed that are able to modulate its effect by modulating the OPC recruitment, survival, and differentiation. This includes the BBI033 monoclonal antibody developed to neutralize the lingo one, which is known to inhibit remyelination via activation of ROE. RHM22, a recombinant human IgM antibody targeting the oligo oligodendroglial vitronectin of the fibronectin receptor, which has shown to decrease the OPC's apoptosis and to simultaneously elevate the proliferation of oligodendrocyte by lowering the threshold of the PDGF stimulation. And the humanized IG4 antibody against CMO4D, which is called VX15, that interferes with the interaction of CMO4D with the plexin B1, shown to improve the differentiation in the OPC differentiation and the better recovery in EAE model. The GSK239512 was initially identified as a stimulator of oligodendroglial differentiation in a compound screening showed to, shows to enhance the MBP expression in the cells. The another very recent compound is benzotrophin, which inhibits the oligodendroglial not signaling may exert beneficial effect on oligodendrocyte differentiation and enhance OPC uh, differentiation by activation of uh, by, by, um, by activation of the glucocortic receptor signaling axis is the colbitazol. Finally, uh, the one that has been working in the Robin Frankson group is the IXR4204 small molecule that is used to activate the retinic acid uh, receptor. Finally, we, the, there are some challenges in translating as why we don't see some of these drugs coming into the clinical trial. So most of these drugs has been uh, validated in one of the clinical models, which has its own limitation. Hence, the lack of the preclinical model of the disease uh, prevents the recapitulate all aspects of limits its ability to test its true potential. The second and most uh, the, the, the second and most um, a challenge in drug in the drug is uh, can the can this molecule cross the BBB and can they activate the oligodendrocyte precursor cell uh, by main, and also maintain the cellular homeostasis in the central nervous system. Can the, uh, also act as the neuronal production is a big question. And most importantly, what time window do we administer these? Uh, these are the challenges that we still need to identify before these can be identified. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge some of uh, my team members and, and the collaborators that have been part of this study. Thank you, Dr. Syed. We've received several questions for you, so let's get started. Yeah. Dr. Syed. Have you observed similar OPC differentiation blockade with other efferins? Yes. Um, uh, I have looked for the uh, class B, class efferin, B1, B2, and B3. All of these molecules do exert the inhibitory effect. However, the most uh, pronounced inhibitory effect is seen in the efferin B3 compared with other efferin B class molecules. Thank you, Dr. Syed. Have you considered how remyelination progresses in the context of neuroinflammation, 
particularly in the setting of multiple sclerosis? That's a very, very good question. Um, as I said, one of the challenges um, uh, in testing this molecule in the preclinical model of the disease is um, we can just look at one aspect of the disease or other. If I had to, the most of the uh, preclinical model that I used is toxin-based, which is good to study the dynamics of remyelination. However, not very, they are not very efficient in uh, studying the inflammatory part of the pathology. So, uh, in order to do this, we had to, uh, which we are currently doing, is to test its efficacy in the EAE model. And uh, I don't have results yet, but this work is undergoing at the moment. Thank you. Do you have any reason to suspect that the efferins would be useful therapeutic agents in peripheral nerve injury? Um, the uh, the uh, what I have seen is that the peripheral nervous system don't exp there is no expression of efferin B3 there. So um, and, and the PNS myelin is completely different to that of the central nervous system myelin. And when I have seen, uh, uh, when I have done the immunoblots and staining on the peripheral nervous uh, myelin uh, uh, and also immunoglobin, we couldn't see the presence of efferin B3 in the peripheral nervous system. We suggest that the, this approach may not be relevant for uh, PNS myelin regeneration. Thank you. Which markers and antibodies are the best, in your opinion, to identify oligodendrocyte precursor cells from mature oligodendrocytes? Which ones do you prefer? Um, the best uh, antibody that has the, the, that is that we are using to identify the early stage are A to B5. Uh, however, this could be slightly challenging as sometimes it works, sometimes it's not that efficient. So, uh, but the best uh, one to, um, uh, at least uh, in the tissues sections, are the PDGF uh, alpha receptor antibody to look at the progenitor population. In the cell culture, it would be either A to B5 or NG2. And if you're you, going Dr. more towards the pre-myelinating stage, then it will be O4. And, and, and then for the myelinating stage, it would be MBP uh, and the PLP. Thank you, Dr. Syed. We have one last question for you. Um, to your knowledge, are there any commercially available sources of oligodendrocytes or precursor cells that would be appropriate for these types of experiments for a researcher without access to an animal facility? Um, could you repeat the question one more time? Are there any commercially available sources of oligodendrocytes and oligodendrocyte precursor cells that would be appropriate for these types of experiments for someone who doesn't have access to an animal facility? Um, um, the another uh, source of, um, I mean, the answer is no. Um, the, however, there are some um, cell lines that could be used uh, to, 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 I mean, to study um, uh, these like uh, olig, um, olig and uh, neonin 2, which are the uh, oligodendroglial cell lines. However, they're not that efficient in recapitulating all aspects of the differentiation. So unfortunately, uh, I think there is no other way except this way in order to progress in my view. Thank you, Dr. Zayed. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their email addresses will be shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and you'll receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today and for sharing your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Syed, as well as our webinar sponsors, R&D Systems, and BioLegend. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.